turn to Luke chapter 7, Luke 7. We continue our series going through the Gospel of Luke, a series I've entitled The Stories of Life. The Gospels record the story of the life of Jesus Christ, and in them we learn about life, and we learn about how God would call us to live this life. He tells us many things, and some of these stories are pretty amazing. You know, there are amazing things in the world, right? You know, you'll spend a little time, you know, on YouTube or Facebook, and you'll, you'll, you'll run across something amazing, right? You know, dogs juggling chainsaws or, you know, cats. No, cats never do anything amazing. <laughs> dogs juggling cats. Okay, that would be amazing. Okay, I'm going to get letters. Do not send me cat videos. <laughs> Saying right now. And they're amazing things. You know, you'll see some guy, usually a guy, doing something just reckless and dumb. And when we say, oh, wow, amazed at that stuff. There's amazing things. There's things in the, and just in nature that they're just amazing. They, they just fill it. They're marvelous. They fill us with awe. Have you ever asked yourself the question, have you ever wondered, what amazes God? In our text for today, we're going to see that Jesus marveled at something. Another way of saying that, Jesus was amazed by something. And what I'm going to say to you right now is if Jesus was marveled, he marveled at something, he was amazed at something, we ought to take note of it. There's probably a lesson in it for us. In fact, there is a lesson. Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing here, right, talking about it. There is a lesson in it for us. So let's pray, and then we'll get into this marvelous story, a story of faith, power, and hope. Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, that right now you would, you would minister to us, that you would, through your Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us. Lord, there are things in your word that we need to see, we need to understand. And sometimes we, we kind of lose the message in, in you know, some, of the, you know, some of the stuff that's just amazing to us. And so I pray, Lord, that we, would, that we would be able to discern what it is you're trying to say to your church and to each of us individually. And Lord, it's already been said today, and, and I think it's really important today. Lord, we come, we come to a time like this, we come to a place like this, and we sometimes bring, we bring stuff with us. We bring junk. We bring our sadnesses, our hurts, our, our struggles, our worries, our fears, our pains, just so many different things. And Lord, I, I believe that right now you're calling us to lay all those things down just, just for a time that we might sit in your presence and hear from your spirit. Open up your word to us now, we pray in Jesus' name, and we pray it in his name. Amen. The title of this morning's message is A Marvelous Story. Now, just in context, yeah, you know, we've been taking a long time through this particular section that, that we are still in the same day that we've been in for about a month now, you know, the same day of Jesus' life. You know, he went up on the mountain, he prayed all night long, and when he came down, he chose the 12 who would be his apostles, and, and then he, he taught this message to his disciples specifically about what it means to be a true disciple. And now he comes down from the plain from this area where he was teaching and ends up in the city of Capernaum. And we're going to have uh, three points today, three-point message. I always love those three-point messages. Marvelous story. The first point in our message is a marvelous faith. Verse 1 of chapter 7. Now, when he had concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. A little context here. The, a centurion is a Roman military officer. You, you guys may already know this. I'm just going to say it for the people that are watching online that might not, because there might be a couple of them. Right, Nathan? Yeah, thank you. A Roman centurion is a Roman military officer and is in charge of about 100 men. And, uh, you know, typically they, they you know, they, they, they they could come directly from Italy, or they could come from other places. The Romans had, had, had conquered a big chunk of the world. 
they had come in and conquered the nation of Israel, and they had stationed these centurions with their troops all, oh, <coughs> excuse me, all over the land to maintain order, to collect taxes, you know, to make sure that you know, they don't rebel, those, kinds of, those sorts of things. So a Roman centurion is, uh, is fairly influential. You know, he's a pretty important guy in town. He has this guy. He has a, they're, 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 they're people of influence. They're people of authority. They are the highest authority in the area. If, unless there's a, you know, a, a Roman governor or somewhere around them, they're, they're it. They're the big dogs. And they're, you know, the, he, there's a position of, uh, he has a person of wealth. So in the context of our message, he has at least one servant. More likely he had more than that. But this particular servant was very important to him. And the word, said, the, the word in our text says dear. The understanding of it is, is more accurately important. This, this servant was important to this centurion. He probably was responsible for running his household. And, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, you know the, it was the main guy that was kind of keeping his things together. And this guy was sick, not just sick. He was, he was dying. He was going to die unless something happened. Well, he hears about Jesus, and so he sends um, some guys to Jesus. So when he heard about, verse 3, about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving, for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. There's a lot of peculiar things in that particular little section of scripture right there. The, remember, the Romans were a conquering nation. They were, they were the oppressors, if you will. They had come in, they had overrun the place, they were, they were telling the Jews how to live their lives, they were taking their money, and, you know, and, and the Romans weren't always nice about that. And so the attitude that, that a typical Jew would have toward the Romans was at the very least, at the very best, would be tolerant of them because they didn't really have a choice. Typically, they despised them. And yet we see this particular centurion has developed a relationship with the elders of the Jews. These are the leaders of the Jewish community, probably the community of Capernaum, to the point where they, they are going to Jesus on his behalf to beg him to come and heal this centurion's servant. And they say the reason why you do it, because he deserves you to come do this because of what he's done for us. He loves our nation, he loves the nation of Israel, and he's built us a synagogue. So it kind of says some things to us about them. The Romans typically were uh, pagan, meaning they worshiped, gods, you know, lower, lowercase g, uh, false gods, and they had a grip load of them. You know, different uh, seasons of life or different situations of life, you would, pick, you would pick a god and say, this is my god. And, you know, the Roman centurion, probably a god of war or power or strength would be his god. And yet we get a sense from this that this particular centurion is a little bit different. In fact, he might even be a God worshiper. He might worship the one true God. How he came to that, we have no idea. But that's the sense we get here. He, he loved Israel probably because he was introduced to the God of Israel. And through that, um, he um, expressed that love by building them a synagogue. Not sure he would have been welcome in that synagogue, being, you know, a, a pagan, Roman, whatever he was, but he at least built it. And so the Jews come to him and say, this guy deserves you to come and do this. Well, Jesus is going to go in one of the other texts. He says, I will go. I will heal him. And, and he said, you know, says, okay, I'll go. He's going to heal him. But one, one of the things we understand is that, is that no one, no one deserves the grace of God. No one. No one is worthy. No one deserves God's grace. Does somebody understand? If it is the grace of God, it is undeserved. Because if you deserve it, it's no longer grace. 
And so God is going to do this radical thing through Jesus into this, this non-Jewish guy. We don't, get, we don't see a lot of non-Jews being touched by Jesus. So he's going he's to have this interaction with him, and he's going to do something amazing here. But it's not because he deserves it, because no one deserves it. Verse 6, then Jesus went with them. And when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. That is amazing. Jesus is going to, in the next verse, is going to marvel at this guy's faith. He says, how do, you, how do you have that kind of faith? He's looking at this centurion who's not even one of the people of God, and he's saying, he's saying, I haven't even seen this kind of faith in Israel. He's blown away by this guy's faith. I want Before I jump to that verse, I want to just kind of draw out three things we observe about this, this guy's faith. A marvelous faith. The first thing that is, he has a right view of himself. Twice he says, I am not worthy. I am not worthy. We have to have a right view of ourselves. Faith is, is knowing God and believing God and acting like we believe God. But one of the places we have to get to is where we see ourselves the same way that God sees us. And he recognizes that, you know, while the Jews, the, the, the elders of the Jews said that this guy deserves it, he's worthy of this miracle, he recognized in himself, no, I'm not. I am not worthy of anything, certainly not for you to come under my home, under my roof, recognizing something about himself. Jesus is going to heal this guy, this, this servant, and he's going to exercise the supernatural, sovereign, creative power of God to do it. And we recognize that what we need to remember and always remember is that faith is absolutely critical to that. Faith is the conduit through which the power of God flows. Power-filled faith can only be found in someone who has a right view of themselves. If we think too highly of ourselves, you're not going to experience the power of God in your life. If you don't have a right view of who you are in God's kingdom, it's going gonna, it's gonna to inhibit your ability to know and experience the power of God. Now you couple with that the second thing, which is a right view of Jesus. You know, he has, this, he has this view of Jesus. I, I am not worthy. I, don't, I did not think myself worthy to come to you. I, I am so unworthy. I can't even come to you. I, you can't come under my roof, and I can't come to you. I'm not worthy of that. You're too much bigger than me. <laughs> Remember who this guy is. He's a centurion. He is the Roman authority in that area. And he says, you're way more than that. Now, now this guy's. you remember that Jesus is famous at this point. Everybody, especially around the area of Capernaum, because he's been operating there, he's been ministering there, he's done miracle after miracle after miracle there, and teachings, and all these things are going on. And so, and so he's heard about Jesus. Everybody's heard about Jesus. And so he's, he's seeing that, and he's recognizing there's something about him. And he puts himself in that right place. I am not. I am not him. Uh, we can't really say for sure, for sure who he knew Jesus was. He says he's more than just a man. And for a Roman centurion to say that, what he's saying is that because the Roman centurions thought they were something. You know, they thought they were, you know, everything. They were, they were, they were tough guys. He looked at Jesus, no, there's something more about him. Not only that, the third thing we see here is he had a right view of what Jesus could do. He says, say the word and my servant will be healed. That is amazing. How did he know that? 
How did he know that Jesus didn't have to actually come and do some sort of a ritual and some sort of a, you know, thing, you know? You know, some sort of, you know, dance around, you know, throwing dust in the air. Who knows what they might have thought they had to do, you know, kill a chicken over, you know, I, you know, I don't know. How did he know that his authority was so great that, that Jesus didn't even have to come? Just say the word. You know, there's this, this reality that, you know, while we, while we live in the material world and we tend to think and focus our minds on the material world, there is a supernatural world. There's a world outside of us. There's a world that we can't see. It interacts with us. It touches us, but we can't touch it. We can't, we can't really interact with it the way that, that, you know, we do in the natural world. And so, you know, this centurion seems to understand that there is a supernatural element to this, that while his servant is sick and he wants him to be healed, that it doesn't have to be a physical thing that makes it happen. It's greater than that. It's beyond that. It's, it, it's, it's supernatural. It's above the natural world. He says, you don't have to come here to do that. What does that mean for us? Now, I love the fact there is no limit to what God can do, right? Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. That there is no limit to what God can do. And he doesn't need a formula. He doesn't need a system. He doesn't need, he, and we're going to see in a little bit, he doesn't even need faith to do miracles. This centurion had a need. And he knew that he couldn't do anything about it. Matter of fact, he was at a point where it was totally, completely beyond him. Yeah, but he knew Jesus could do something about it. And he acted on what he believed. And Jesus notices, verse 9, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, or he was amazed at him, and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Here's this centurion who has more faith than the people of God. Yikes. At the beginning of the message, I asked the question, what amazes God? And, and the simple answer to that is nothing amazes God. God knows everything. He's always known everything. He will always know everything. And so there's nothing we can do to surprise him, nothing we can do to amaze him. And so what we're seeing here, because we believe Jesus is God, was always God, but we see him in his humanity here, that he, he set aside those aspects of his deity for the purpose of coming as one of us. And so he related to the world in the same way that we do. He looked at the situation and he was amazed, marveled at the faith of this centurion. Interestingly, there are only two places in the gospel records of Jesus being amazed. Only twice. Once here and then also in Mark chapter 6 when he was in his hometown of Nazareth and he was he marveled at their unbelief, their lack of faith. Both ends of the spectrum. Here we are. Here we are in a place where you ought to believe and you don't. And here's a place where we don't expect you to believe, but you do. And he marveled at both of them. Our faith is important to God. God notices our faith. Centurion had the right view of himself and of Jesus and acted upon what he knows about Jesus. How do we do that? How do we, how do we develop that right view of ourselves and that right view of Jesus or God and, and that, that understanding of what God can do? Well, if you have a Bible in your hand, lift it up. That's how you do it. Lift it up. Come on, pretend like you're listening. Thank you. Golly, people killing me kidding our bible teaches us you know the one of the one of the illustrations or parables or however you want to describe it simile whatever you want to describe it of, of the bible to me is a mirror the bible is a mirror and if you look into the bible you should see a reflection of jesus because he is literally on every page you, it's not always easy to see there but he's on every single page not only can we see Jesus there, 
but if we're looking with open hearts, we'll see ourselves. And that's what God wants. He wants us to see ourselves. And he wants us to see ourselves. He wants us to see him next to Jesus so that we can compare ourselves. That's not always fun, right? Somebody say, no, that's not fun. Sometimes that's not fun. But what God's trying to do is he wants us, he wants us to see Jesus and he wants us to see ourselves. And what ultimately what he's trying to do for us is he's trying to change us. Jesus is never going to change because Jesus is perfect. He's never going to change us. So we look in God's word, we see what Jesus looks like. I look at myself, I see what I look. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to change me so that I eventually am superimposed behind Jesus. That when I look into scripture, that my life so lines up with the life of Christ that all I see is Jesus. Because ultimately, that's what God wants to see, wants the world to see when they look at my life. They want the world to see only Jesus when they look at me. In case you're wondering, I'm not there yet. Still working on it. I think I might have one little tip or one little pinky maybe lined up. I'm working on it. Be patient with me. The centurion believed. The centurion had this right idea of who he was, who Jesus was, and what Jesus could do. And when he acted upon that, the miracle happened. Verse 10. And those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well who had been sick. And the, the sense of that word well there is completely whole. He was, he was back to full strength, full power, and back to a normal life from being on the verge of death to being fully alive. That's the power of God. Turn your Bible to John chapter 14, John 14. You know, we might ask the question, does, does God still do that? Does God still heal? <clears throat> and, you know, some people answer, yes, of course he does. Does God still heal in the same way that Jesus healed centurion servant? In John chapter 14, Philip was with Jesus, and he asked, them the, he asked him, hey, show us the Father. We want to see the Father. You know, show us God is what he's saying. Show us God. And Jesus responds here in John chapter 14, verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me, the words that I speak to you? I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Works in this context is the miracles. All the miraculous things that Jesus did are, are, are comprised in this word works here. Verse 11, believe in me, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. He's saying, hey, you know, I'm telling you that, you know, the Father and I are one. We're, we are, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, meaning I, I am the visible representation of the invisible God. You want to know what God looks like? You look at Jesus. That's what he's saying to us. And he said, if you're having trouble believe that, believe in the miracles. The, the miracles, if you believe in the miracles, only God could do what he was doing in those miracles. So they're, they're proof, you know, the the, the writers in the, the Old Testament, they kept saying that this person that will ultimately be the Messiah, the Savior of the world, would do miracles, and very specific miracles, the miracles that Jesus did. Verse 12, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works or miracles that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If we go to God in faith, if we have that right understanding, that right view of who we are and, and, the, and we have the right view of who God is and believe what God can do, the Bible tells us that God is listening and that he will act. Now, does that mean that he always heals everybody that we pray for? No, it doesn't mean that. But he can. He can. God heals according to his will, purposes, and plan. 
when Jesus was on the earth, that means every single person that Jesus touched was healed, every single one. Because God had a plan, had a purpose, had a will in that. He was trying to communicate something to the world through the, the healing ministry of Jesus while he was on this earth. And that was to reveal to the world that there is a Savior. To, to make it very clear to the whole world that he was who he said he was. So that when he said, I'm going to die on the cross, when I die on the cross, it's for your sins. If you believe that, you will be saved. But after he did that, no longer does he need to do that ministry. But I believe. I believe he can heal. I believe he does heal. I've experienced healing. I've seen healing. I've seen other miracles. I've seen all kinds of miracles in my life. I've seen things I'm not sure they were miracles. I call them miracles anyways. He's still doing that. But it requires faith. And we need to keep going to God, not just for the big stuff. We can go to him for the little stuff. We can go for him for anything that's on your heart you can go to God for. Because he hears. Faith is the conduit through which God's supernatural creative power flows to accomplish the great things in this world that we need. Turn back to Luke 7. The centurion has this marvelous faith, and God reward, rewarded his faith with this amazing miracle. This story continues, this marvelous story continues with another miracle, even greater than that one, though in reality, all of God's miracles require the same amount of energy on God's part. You know, they're no big deal. God does one miracle, God heals a hangnail just as easily as you raise the dead. You know, there, this doesn't take that much for God. For us, we look at them and we marvel at them. This one's interesting because the first one, the centurion, had the faith. He acted in faith, and it was through his faith that we see this miracle really manifest the way that it did. This next one, no one's faith was involved. Reminds us that God doesn't even need us to do great things in this world, though he invites us to be a part of it. Second part of this, this story is a marvelous compassion, verse 11 of Luke 7. Now it happened the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and a large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the city was with her. Luke is very specific refers to this woman as a widow, which means her husband has died. And this dead man is her only son. And in that time and culture, that's a big deal. That would left her with no one to take care of her. And so it was a, it was a distressing thing. We know that this, this dead man is, a, is an adult male, based on the way that the language is written. We're going to read a little bit later that Jesus refers to him as young man, which means he's younger than Jesus is. So that puts him in his probably 20s, early 20s. He's a young guy. So this woman has lost her husband and her only son, a young son. Very, very difficult time. The death of a child, regardless of how old they are, is unnatural and hard to bear. Carl Jung said, it, the death of a child, is a period placed before the end of a sentence. It doesn't, it's not supposed to be that way. Death in itself is unnatural. It's not the way God originally intended the system to work. But the death of a child is especially hard. And I know some of you have experienced the pain of a loss of a child or a grandchild. And in this church, we've had many, many experiences with that happening even before the sen sentence began through miscarriage. Jesus understands what that feels like. It tells us here that he had compassion. Verse 13 when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. The word compassion there tells us 
that as Jesus is walking into this village and sees coming out of the village this group of people carrying the coffin and, and this woman either before or after, I don't, remember, I don't know how they would have done that, she is, she is just weeping, probably uncontrollably. And there are people all around that are mourning with her. Often they would even hire professional mourners depending on the severity and the, and the sense of loss that was experienced here. And so all of this, this darkness, if you will, sadness. And he felt something inside of himself. When it says he had compassion, that means he felt it inside of himself. That when, when he saw that, he was moved with feeling. His heart was touched. And when he felt it, it drove him to respond. And he says to her, do not weep. Now, what he's not saying to her, he's not telling her to stop crying, stop being such a crybaby, you know, suck it up. Where's your faith? Not doing that. He's drawing her attention to himself because he's about to do something to change her life and to impact the people around her. Christians can be cruel. Often will suggest to someone that they should not weep at the loss of a loved one. I'll never understand that. The greater we love someone, the more it hurts when the, when the relationship is interrupted by death. Natural or unnatural, death is unnatural. And that sense of loss that we feel is hard. It hurts. Jesus has this marvelous compassion upon her. He feels something, and he's about to do something. The prophet Jeremiah gave us a promise in the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 22. It says this, Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. His compassions fail not. God knows what we feel. Not just knows it, he feels it. Whatever you're feeling, God feels. When you're hurting, God is hurting. When you're mourning, he's feeling that. We are never so far from God that he doesn't feel what we're going through. That is the God we worship, the God we love, is a God that cares so much about us that he connects, us, connects to us in the way that we feel. goes on to say, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. Whatever your burden is, and I know some of you are carrying burdens. Whatever your burden is, Jesus understands. God knows. And we should give it to him. Whatever, whatever hard thing, whatever hurt, whatever pain you are carrying, whatever, whatever is causing you to mourn or to weep, lay it down at his feet. Give it to him. He knows what you're feeling. Give it to him. Give it to him. Give it to Jesus. He's marvelously compassionate. Why is that important? Well, it brings us to our third point. A marvelous hope. Verse 14. Then he came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And so he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he presented him to his mother. Then fear came upon all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited his people. <laughs> this guy's dead, right? I mean, the, the, the system, the way they do things back in that culture at that time, 
if someone died, they were in the ground within about 24 hours. They didn't waste any time dealing with it because they had no way to keep the body from decomposing. So they took care of it right away. So you know, we imagine this guy might have died in, in, during the night or maybe early morning. They go through a process of, of cleansing the body and then anointing it and wrapping it and this whole kind of a ritualistic kind of a thing. And then they, they take him out and they put him in the ground or they put him in a tomb. He'd been dead long enough if they're carrying him out in a coffin for there to be no hope. Way past hoping that something was going to change. Jesus spoke, and boop, he pops right up and starts talking. I want to know what he said. What was the first thing he said after being dead? One of the things this needs to remind us of, death is not the end. Not the end. You know, we, in our mortal human brains and attitudes, we often see death as the end. And we fear it because of that. Terrified of it. Job refers to it as this this terrifying enemy. This man's body was dead. But his soul lived on somewhere. We'll talk about where in chapter 16. So you have to come back next year sometime. (laughs) Jesus came to do something. And this this gives us a picture of it. In 1 Corinthians 15, 54, he said, So when this corruptible, that's this body, is corruptible, that means... It is capable of decay. It is is capable of being broken and being diseased and dying and corrupting. When this corruptible has put on incorruption, which means a body that does not corrupt, and this mortal, meaning this body that can die, has put on immortality, a body that cannot die, then shall be brought to pass a saying that is written, death is swallowed up, In victory, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? When Jesus went to the cross, he was absolutely victorious over death. Death no longer owns us. Before we were saved, death owned us. We were destined to an eternal death. And through Christ and through his cross, we now know that death no longer has a sting for us. No longer is it the end for us. In fact, if we truly understand it, we would say that death is just the beginning. Turn to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. When Jesus died on the cross and was victorious over death, that doesn't mean people stop dying, right? Because people are still dying. But it does change the way we're to view death. Paul is writing in in Thessalonians, he's writing to a church that he helped to found. And one of the issues that they have at that church is, you know, they they believe that Jesus is coming back. Anybody here believe that Jesus is coming back? And he could be back any day, right? Any moment we believe that. Well, they believe that too. and, And Jesus hadn't come back, but people died. And they're thinking, well, what does that mean? Did they miss it? You know, did they miss the return of Jesus Christ? And they were concerned about that. And so Paul writes this letter to them to encourage them, to bring them comfort. Verse 13 of chapter 4 says this, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow, as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, which you believe that, say amen. Amen. Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. The the word sleep or fallen asleep there is an idiom or a figure of speech to point to death. Those who have died. But Paul only uses it for believers. Believers. Not for unbelievers. And I believe there's a message just in that alone. 
that while death is not something we look forward to, it's also not something we're supposed to be afraid of. That we're to fear death as much as we fear going to sleep at night. Because ultimately, when you die, you wake up in the Lord's presence where you will be forevermore. Powerful, powerful stuff. Verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, those who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with them. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Jesus is coming back for his church soon. And all of our loved ones who have preceded, all of those who have died, who are in Christ, who are believers of Jesus Christ, they're going to be raised up right before he does. Matter of fact, just an instant before we get caught up, they're raised up. And we'll meet them and him in the air. Maranatha. Paul tells them to, to be comforted by that. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. You're getting a little, little Bible exercise this morning. It's good for you. I promise. If you get tired, it's all right. We're almost done. A day will come when the dead in Christ will be raised. Our marvelous hope, or elsewhere it says our blessed hope, is that return of Christ when he comes to get his church and take us to be with him forever. It's a doctrine that we call the rapture. And we believe it could happen at any moment. There, there is nothing, nothing in the way. There's no prophecy that needs to be fulfilled. There's no activities. There's no different things. There may be some things that happen beforehand, but nothing has to happen before the rapture of the church. Jesus could come back right this moment or the next. Okay. I'm not a prophet, not saying I am. I don't know anything, but he could come back at any moment. Referring to this blessed hope, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep. Now, if we understand sleep to be death, we shall not all die. Anybody volunteering to, you know, to do that one? That's the one I want. Yeah, I'm not afraid of death. I'm just not keen on the idea of it, right? You know, I'm just not too cool on the idea of dying. But we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, where the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The day will come when we will cast off these mortal bodies, and they'll be replaced by immortal bodies, a body that cannot get sick cannot become diseased, cannot be broken, cannot die. In fact, when that happens, death gets swallowed up. You know what that means for us? We don't even think about death again. Right now, the whole world revolves around death. You cannot escape it. You cannot go through a single day without being confronted with some aspect of death because it is all around us. If you eat a cheeseburger this afternoon, you know, something died, okay? Chicken, you're still, you know, you're still killing it something, okay? And I'm not suggesting we all become vegans. I'm sure that is contrary to the will of God. Oh, that's going to get me letters too. Darn it! My email address is randy at calvaryfv.com. 
right away. <laughs> We're going to be changed. Listen, 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 everyone. Just focus for just another couple of seconds. I'm actually going to finish on time today, praise the Lord. Unless Jesus comes back really soon, you will have to face sickness or disease or brokenness or death. It's the reality. That is going to come into our lives. But we have a hope. And that hope is Jesus Christ. And he's in heaven preparing a place for us right now. When he's done preparing that place, he's going to come and get us. And so we don't, we are as, as Christians, as believers, we don't focus on the, the reality of this death-filled world that we live on. We focus on heaven, that our hope is there, that we, whenever we get confronted with those things, that we ought, to, we ought as quickly as we're able to lift our eyes out of those things and look up. When Jesus said to her, do not weep, he's saying, look at me, look at me. Let me show you something. Watch what I'm about to do. And then we need to do the same thing. When we get to that place, when that, that, that hard thing, and brothers and sisters, I know, I know, I know, I know those hard things are in your life, and some of, the, some of you are carrying those burdens right now. And nothing I'm going to say is make it any easier for you. But what I would say to you is, as much as you're able, lift your eyes out of those circumstances and lift them up to our hope, which is Jesus Christ in heaven. Jesus is our hope. And God is still writing his story. He's writing his story through his people. God is still healing. He is still doing miracles. He's raising the dead spiritually more than physically every day. Who knows how many thousands of people are being raised to life from spiritual death to life. His story is being written as his people exercise their faith. He's not done writing that story. He's not done writing the story of his son in this world. And he's going to do it through us. Something I've said to you before. That as he's writing that story, who is the pen that he's using? I am. Not just me. Stephen, too. Mark. Each of you is the pen that God's using. And I'll leave you with just one quick thought, and then, and then we're going to be done. One question. Are you letting God use you to write that story? Or are you writing your own story? Because you're doing one or the other. You're either letting God use you to write the story of his son in this world or you're writing your own story. And the story of Jesus in this world is a story of hope, a story of faith, a story of power. That's the story I want to write. How about you? Amen? Heavenly Father, we come. We thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy, your love. We thank you, Lord God, that you came into the world to give us hope. That, that while, while the reality of death is all around us and nothing, nothing we're going to do in this world is going to change that, Lord, that we don't have to, we don't have to live in that, 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 that attitude of death. In fact, we can turn our eyes to you and live in the, in the, the glory of hope, a hope that is real, a hope that is tangible, a hope that strengthens and buoys us up when we are, when we are sinking. When, those, when, we, when it gets so dark we can't see, we cling to that hope and it brightens our, our lives and gives us the, the light that we need to move on even one more day. And I pray for these, your people today, wherever they are, some of them maybe not having to deal with any of those kinds of things right now. And I pray that they don't. And I pray, Lord God, that you would, you would help them to cling to you so that if, if something ever does happen, they've got the faith they need to go through it. And those that are, that are struggling right now to just even go one more day, Lord, I pray that you would help them to, to turn their eyes to you and to know, Lord God, that you care. You feel what they're feeling right now. And by feeling that, you understand. 
you are sympathetic to our suffering, to our hurts, and that you love us so much that you intend to do something about it. And Lord, we, we, we don't always see that. We don't always understand that. But Lord, you always answer our prayers. You always respond to us, even when we don't see it or understand it. And so I pray, Lord, that we would cling to you, that we would lay our burdens down at your feet, that we would allow your Holy Spirit to, to fill us with the faith that we need by getting to know you better, getting to know ourselves and getting to know you better, that we might understand better how it is that we're to walk in this life, how we're to be a part of the story that you're writing into this world, that we can be a part of that story in such a way that people see Jesus in this place. Lord, help us to be a people that lives to glorify you, bless others, and grow in faith. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.